Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar titled COVID-19 Infection Mechanism Tools for Testing and Therapeutic Antibody Development. This webinar is part of the ongoing coronavirus webinar series. I am Kaylee Bach of Labberts and I will be the moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labberts and sponsored by Genscript. To learn more, visit genscript.com. Now let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you would like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you're having trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Ask a Question box located in the far left of your screen. As a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speakers, Dr. Sean Taylor and Dr. Manzu Kane. Dr. Taylor holds a PhD and an MBA from McGill University and has spent the past 10 years publishing articles providing seminars, workshops, and training videos to help the global scientific community achieve excellent data from Western blotting, qPCR, and digital PCR experiments. He has managed teams of field application scientists in Canada for over a decade who have helped thousands of scientists achieve their research goals. In his current role as North American FAS Manager for GenScript, he leads a dedicated team to continue the tradition of providing pertinent and timely information to help the scientific community overcome research hurdles to accelerate the production of high quality publishable data cost effectively. Dr. Manzu Kang received her PhD from the University of California, Los Angeles, with a dissertation focusing on the impact of combinatorial therapy on the evolution of drug resistance. Dr. Kang is a senior scientist of antibody research group at GenScript ProBio. She is in charge of the single base cell screening platform for antibody drug discovery. For a complete biography on our speakers, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Taylor, Dr. Kang, welcome. You may now begin your presentation. America. This video will cover a short tutorial to explain the mechanism, infection rate, and tools for monitoring the novel coronavirus 2019. Other synonyms that are used uh, routinely in the scientific community for coronavirus 2019 is COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, so the second coronavirus that causes SARS, and then 2019 NCoV. So all of these are synonyms that, that people use interchangeably for the same coronavirus that initiated late 2019 in China. So the first um, step in discussing any virus is looking at its structure. And I'm, do, and I'm gonna do this very briefly. There are a lot of articles published which, uh, which describe in, in much more detail and, and much more uh, eloquently the structure of the virus. But to, to, to just briefly overview, the key features in COVID-19 are this spike glycoprotein. This is very important, and I'll discuss this in the next slide. There are a number of glycoproteins that are on the surface of the coronavirus, and they all play different roles and functions. There's also the nucleocapsid proteins, which are inside the uh, nuclear envelope of, uh, inside the, uh, the, the coat of the virus. And then there's also RNA. And the RNA is used by the virus to replicate itself once it, in, it in, is engulfed, is, is, um, is uh, endocytosed into the host cell. So how do we, uh, how does the virus transmit? How does, what is the mechanism of action of COVID-19? So, this image is an image of the virus, and this image is an image of the host cell. So COVID-19 likes to bind by its spike glycoprotein. So this protein here, the spike glycoprotein, is how the virus binds to the host cell. And, it re and this spike glycoprotein very specifically recognizes on host cells this blue 
protein here. It's not blue, it's just colored blue here. And that's called angiotensin converting enzyme 2, ACE2. So this has been identified as a key SARS coronavirus receptor. And it plays a, a protective role in SARS, so in SARS pathogenesis. And this was also published recently uh, in Nature um, by Zhu P. et al. So the spike glycoprotein very specifically binds to the ACE2 receptor on the host cells. And then the host cells endocytose the virus inside the cell. And then the virus replicates itself uh, within the cell. And when it replicates, it eventually leaves the cell. And you can see the virus here kind of exocytosing. It's coming out of the cell after it's replicated itself. And now we have more virus made from the host cell. Now, ACE2 is important to understand because this receptor is, provides protection from deep lung injury. So it's in, the, it's in the cells deep inside the lung. So when COVID-19 binds inside deep in the lung to ACE2, the virus and the receptor, so both of these, the virus and the receptor itself, are internalized into the cell. So you lose these receptors as the virus binds to them and, and takes them inside the cell. <clears throat> the reduction of ACE2 can ultimately lead to pneumonia by a variety of mechanisms. So I'm not going to go through all this. But ACE2 provides a protective role, and, and we need ACE2 to protect ourselves uh, from a variety of, of, of problems that can happen inside the lung. ACE2, that receptor, is not only in the deep lung where, where we see symptoms of the virus with pneumonia and all these things, but we also, it's also expressed highly in the heart, intestine, and kidney, which can also potentially lead to illness in these tissues with COVID-19 infection. So there's a lot of work being done on this to assess how COVID-19 infection affects not just the lungs, which are where we know the, the major symptoms are, but also in, the other, in these other tissues. Spike glycoprotein, which is here in red, contains two subunits. It contains the S1 subunit in yellow, and this is the unit that binds to ACE2, and then it contains an S2 subunit. So these are important when we talk about um, detection of, of the virus, and we'll talk about this in, in the coming slides. Okay, so now let's talk about trans transmission rate and the requirement to monitor the disease. So with viruses, we always use a term called the R0, okay? And we've seen this in movies, uh, pandemic and other movies. So the R0 is, is the transmission, effectively the transmission rate. And for um, COVID-19, um, a recent study was, was performed um, in China, published in the Lancet Journal um, by, uh, by Kursharsky et al., and they determined that without social distancing, so with just the virus running rampant through, through China, through uh, Wuhan, that the R0 was approximately two. So this is without any, any social distancing, any laws in place to prevent people from interacting with each other. So with an R0 of two, what that means is that a single individual can infect two individuals. So imagine one individual infects two and then those two individuals affect two more people and so on and so forth. So you end up with this exponential increase, this doubling of infected people each time the new infected people interact with other individuals. And the rate of infection is approximately six days. So every six days, there's a doubling of the amount of people that are infected if there, if there are no rules or laws in place to prevent people from interacting with each other. So the interpretation, therefore, would be that without social distancing, without any rules in place, one person can infect two people over a six-day period, and the following six days, those people each infect two more people for a total of four people, and within two months, that single person that started off the infection will lead to a thousand people being infected. So that's pretty serious because that, that, that 
you know, causes a large dramatic increase in the amount of infection in the society. What they also did though, Kershaw et al., because then China implemented social distancing, right? They, they closed Wuhan borders, they made people stay in their homes, and they, and they determined that the R0 with social distancing was, was one. So this means that with social distancing, one person only affects one other person over six days. So within the same two month period, there isn't this exponential increase of infection. There will only be a few people infected over a two month period. And effectively the virus can, can just be alleviated, can be, can be rectified by social distancing. So that's what, that's what this study uh, showed. So this, underlines the requirement to monitor the number of global cases because we need to be able to assess the effect of social distancing on this R0 number. Because if the R0 is one or lower, then we're, then we're effectively eradicating the virus. We're effectively keeping the virus under control in society. But if, as soon as the R0 is above one, then we, have, then we can implement have this exponential increase of the virus and infection can run rampant through society and affect our healthcare systems and our economy and everything. Okay, so, so diagnostics, what do we have? There are, there are a variety of diagnostics out there. There are disease diagnostics and then there are virus detection uh, methodologies. So for disease diagnostics, these can be, be uh, as simple as routine blood tests for increased uh, liver enzymes, uh, muscle enzymes, myoglobin, so a variety of, of markers that are in the blood that would denote infection. There are also chest imaging, so you can look at uh, multiple patchy shadows, interst interstitial changes, so this is all lung, uh, lung effects, so you can see pathology in the lungs from viral infection. Now, of course, these blood tests and chest imaging are, are, are quite expensive because it requires going to a hospital, nurses, doctors, equipment, all required to be able to examine you. There are other ways to look at, these are more molecular methods, so nucleic acid detection, and this is, this is one that, that's, that's used a lot and was used a lot for coronavirus. So the first step in the process of nucleic acid detection is determining, determining the nucleic acid sequence of the virus itself, and that was already done in China. So they determined the sequence, and by knowing the sequence of the RNA inside the virus, then they can develop kits to detect the RNA by a technology called real-time PCR or isothermal PCR. So these are, these are methods that are very quick and easy. Uh, they, they require uh, taking a blood sample from the patient or, or sputum or, or a um, variety of fluids that, that, that are secreted from, from, from patients. And then they can detect uh, whether the viral... Uh, RNA is, is in their um, secreted fluids, and that would indicate infection. And it's a very sensitive test. This, this permits you to detect infection very early. There are serology detection methodologies as well, and this is, this is related to when our own immune system starts to battle the virus. So when our immune system battles the virus, we generate antibodies, uh, against the virus itself, and those antibodies then start to circulate in the blood, and, and those antibodies can be detected um, in a variety of, of means. One of them is called ELISA, and those kits uh, can, be, can be made and then used to detect circulating antibodies that we've generated. The advantage of serology detection is that you can detect the antibodies even after the virus has been eradicated by the immune system. So you'll know if a person has, been, has already been infected. With nucleic acid detection, once the virus has been eradicated, there, there will be no more nucleic acids, no more RNA from the virus in, in the uh, secreted fluids, and you won't know if the person's been infected. So, Timing for molecular tests are important, th therefore. And uh, for testing antibodies in, uh, in, in patient blood, it's a good choice for rapid, simple, and highly sensitive uh, diagnosis of the virus. But again, um, 
antibodies for the virus are only made after infection has happened. So it's, it can take several days, up to five to 10 days for antibodies to be generated. So it's widely accepted that IgM, if we look here on a timeline, we can see that the very initial um, detection methodology immediately after infection would be the viral RNA. And that would be by qPCR. So if you really want to know quickly if someone's been infected early on in the infection, then qPCR is the best way to go to detect the viral RNA that's circulating because there's going to be a lot of virus in that patient at that stage. But then as time goes by, we generate antibodies and then we can detect these antibodies later on. So after, vi after the virus has gone away, then we can still detect these antibodies because these antibodies stay with us uh, essentially forever so that we can combat the virus the next time uh, there's, a, there's a, a viral outbreak. So it's widely accepted that IgM provides the first line of defense during viral uh, infections. And then uh, IgG uh, uh, is a later response, even later after infection, that can also be detected. So these are antibodies that can be that can be detected post-infection. Nucleic acid detection for SARS-CoV only gives a positive result when the virus is still present, as I mentioned, and is also dependent on sampling the appropriate tissues or fluids. Remember, uh, this is a deep lung infection, so it's important to swab way back in the throat uh, to assure that the shedding of the virus has come out of the deep lung to the back of the throat. It, it may not be in the saliva, um, early on in the infection, and it may not be in other body fluids. So it's, it can, if the sampling is not done properly, then you can easily get some false uh, negative results with, uh, with nucleic acid detection and qPCR. Antibody tests can confirm the infection, so, that, so they can be used as a, as a complementary test in case uh, the sampling wasn't done properly or in case there's false negatives. The antibody tests uh, can confirm infection and, uh, and would give a positive result even if a PCR test is, uh, of a suspected case is negative. So um, I'm not going to go through this slide in great detail. This is just to, sh just to show that the, vi the virus was sequenced and there are a variety of, of, uh, of targets in the virus, genes, that have been used to, de to make kits for qPCR to detect the virus. So ORF1AB, E, and N, these are all um, regions of the viral genome that are being used to detect the virus uh, by nucleic acid detection. So um, GenScript has come up with, uh, with a few kits um, to do this. We have a one-step kit, which will detect, uh, as, as I mentioned before, the ORF1AB, uh, N, and E. So these kits are all available with primers. So this is very quick, easy detection of the virus available to detect um, um, the uh, presence or absence of virus early on in infection. There are also uh, duplex assays wh where, where these kits can, can detect two of these targets in one test, uh, in one sample. So this is great if the patient has very little sample or if we're very early on in the infection, we don't have very much sample, so we want to detect more than one, or just as a cross test to assure that if one is positive, that the other target is positive so that we're, we get a much more, um, much more strength in the confirmation that the virus is there. And again, these kits are available from GenScript. For serology diagnosis, We've also generated some ELISA kits to detect the IgG and IgM. And these kits are, are, are on the market, they're available. Um, they're all here for, for looking at IgG and IgM analysis from patient um, um, blood samples. So the, the antibodies are circulating in the blood. It's a simple blood test. And then you can detect either a weak positive or strong positive, dependent on the point at which the infection occurred. So this is a good way to cross-reference 
testing with uh, qPCR. So why, uh, why should we use uh, serology tests as well as qPCR? Because qPCR sounds so great because you can detect it early. Well, the reason why you want to use serology tests as well is because we want to trace the overall infection within the population from those who have recovered. Remember, qPCR will not detect the virus if, it, if it's not in the bloodstream. And for recovered patients, there will be no virus left. But the antibodies against the virus will be there. So serology tests are important so that we can understand how many people have actually been infected. Um, so they can be used to also confirm infections. If, if the qPCR test has been done, then a serology test can be used to also help confirm that that patient is in fact positive. And uh, it's, it's good as an accurate and simple uh, point of care test because qPCR requires several steps and kits and equipment. Serology tests are much more simple. They're easier to run. So um, in this case, we had... Uh, several patients that were tested. And all we're showing here is data from a standard curve. So this is, this is a recombinant uh, S1 protein that was diluted, just to show where, how sensitive the kit can go, how much dilution you can use before you're, able, before you're not able to get a good signal from the ELISA test. And with actual patient samples from plasma, we recommend to to not go below a 1 in 1,000 dilution of the plasma samples to get a good signal for the IgG and IgM tests. Uh, 1 in 100 is actually even better, but you could go as low as 1 in 1,000 and still get um, a signal that is above um, the, um, the healthy controls. So these are the healthy control signals. So the entire spectrum of proteins and assays for COVID-19 are assembled on the GenScript website. You can click here at genscript.com slash virus underscore antigens. And here we've assembled the full list of available proteins and assays, the N protein, all of the S proteins, and some fusion proteins, all available or very, very soon to be available, as well as the ACE2 receptor protein, antibodies, and the two ELISA detection kits, which are currently available. So if you want to quickly detect, the ELISA kits are, are available, and for assembling assays, all the proteins are available on the website. We also have a services platform which can provide customized proteins for producing exotic assays or tests or research. So we have, of course, the qPCR detection assay, either singleplex or duplex, as well as plasmids and proteins and antibodies for COVID-19 research that can be customized to the desire of whatever research or kits that you are planning on producing. So we hope that you stay safe in this new age of social distancing. Let's reduce that R naught down to one or lower so that we can move on past COVID-19. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today at the Lab Roots webinar series. Um, my name is Manju Kong, I'm a senior scientist at the Antibody Drug Discovery Department um, at GenScript Profile. Today I'm going to talk to you about the accelerated COVID-19 antibody discovery with ProSpeed single B-cell technology. First, I'm going to talk to you about um, the background of COVID-19, and next I'm going to present you with some of our um, newest data results um, for for um, the antibody discovery for COVID-19. Uh, and lastly, I'm going to focus on the single cell screening for COVID-19. COVID-19 has um, developed into a global pandemic that's affecting thousands, if not millions, of lives globally. By March 31st, uh, the total confirmed cases reported by the SCCE at Johns Hopkins uh, reaches over 784,000. And there are tremendous resources and efforts that are being poured into developing either the vaccination for uh, protecting the general population over the long run or therapeutic agents to treat 
infected individuals. There are seven different major drug targets that, uh, that can be used for COVID-19. The one that's probably the most prominent or the most explored is the spike protein, which is on the surface of the viral particle, and it's responsible for the interaction with the ACE2 receptor on the host cell surface uh, for, for the subsequent um, viral entry. And there are the other drug targets include the envelope protein, the membrane protein, the protease, um, the nucleocapsid protein, the hemagglutinin esterase, and the helicase. And there are also 16 non-structural proteins that can be targeted as well. But like I mentioned again, the spike protein is probably the ones that's being the most explored. So at GSM, we have three different major antibody discovery platforms, which are hybridoma, hybridoma the antibody library, and we have both the human naive library, uh, the human synthetic library is under is being developed right now, and then also uh, the the llama naive library for generating SDAB or the single domain antibody, and our newest addition for our ABD platforms is the single B cell screening um, platform adopting the uh, the the beacon platform from Berkeley Lights, and we are um, utilizing all our all of our platforms um, to, to screen for desirable leads against COVID-19, which uh, have the following three characteristics. The first is uh, the ability to bind to spike protein, and the second is to block S protein and ACE2 interaction, and lastly, or ultimately, to neutralize or inhibit the COVID-19 infectivity. And on this slide, I'm presenting you some of our newest results from the phage display screening against COVID-19. Uh, the target that we're using is RBD of S1 protein or the receptor binding domain of S1 protein. Uh, and we're screening against both our human naive library and llama naive library. The unique binder that we got for human naive library is over 70. And then we have about 48 um, SDAB screened from the llama naive library. Here, um, what, you, what I'm showing you is the facts result for some of the, uh, the, the binders that we're characterizing in vitro. Um, first, we did a RBD or the dose response for, for the EC50 of RBD binding on the, the ACE2 or the ACE2 receptor expressed on the stable cell line. And what you can see right here is the partial blocking of, um, of the interaction or, or the binding between the RBD and ACE2 on, on stable cell lines. Um, so, and what's some? And I'm highlighting some of the, the, the more interesting results. We have one lead uh, with a, a KD at the nanomolar range that has a very significant or substantial blocking effect as well. And some of our um, want to some of the things that I want to point out is um, we do have some binders uh, that that. That has not that um, that has a pretty pretty good blocking effect, but on the ELISA results for the binding, it was not the best. It was not our best binder, but it was it shows a very very good um, blocking effect, which is in concordance with some of the newest results uh, from other. Um, I guess research or, or, or people as well, where your the, the blocking effects that, that you that you you might be looking for may not be coming from your best binder. So that's just something um, to, to keep in mind. So moving on, I'm going to focus on the single cell screening for COVID-19. Uh, to give you an overview of our gene script pro-speed system, um, from immunization to recombinant MAB production, the shortest timeline that we can achieve is uh, one to one and a half month with express immunization, which takes about two weeks. And the general workflow involves um, after immunization, the B cell will be harvested and enriched for plasma cell. And those B cell subset will be imported or penned into the chip that's used for screening and with various in-chip assays, including specificity, affinity, and functionality. And after we analyze the results and pick our desirable lead, the export um, 
The single VCL will be exported into 96 well plates. And follow that is the cDNA synthesis and sequencing and recombinant MAB production. And what I want to point out right here is from B cell harvest to exporting the single B cell um, that you picked out, this process can be finished within less than a day. And immediately you can see how valuable this platform can be for developing um, antibody leads. Um, that, that are extremely time sensitive. And this is a fully automated, efficient, and comprehensive platform to really accelerate your antibody discovery. The general workflow um, involves three major steps. First is to import, import your sample, and then next is to assay. And here uh, we're showing you the assay can be done in a multiplex fashion where um, we can do multiple assays at the same time or have different different results or different readouts for, for for one singular assay run and after that is exporting your uh, your your cell of interest into 96 well play for downstream single cell sequencing so here I'm going to show you a little video of how exactly each process um, takes place so the penny is um, is where the um, the OEP or the the opto electro positioning system, where you can see as the little cages that's identifying and uh, directing single cells into the nano pen or the little room or uh, uh, I guess the segregating the segregation that can be achieved at the single cell level. So each cell can be directed in a single pen for a single cell isolation. So this is also a reason why the importing is called penning. As you can see again, the cells are being identified and directed or being moved into the bottom of the pens to achieve single cell isolation. And here the next part is the assay. So I'm gonna play the little video again for you. And what you see right here is the signal that's being detected as what we call a fluorescent bloom, where, uh, at, so if you look at the, uh, the, the specific pen, you're seeing um, the signal that's generated or accumulated over time um, at, the, at the opening of each pen. So what that means is that at this particular pen, you have a plasma cell that's secreting antibody um, of your interest, and it's being detected by your assay system over this area or in a channel. And the signal can be very sensitive um, and also robust. The detection, it can be done within minutes, and it's highly reliable because um, it's, it's basically taking a multiple time points uh, or data points over time. Uh, and again, the multiplex assay can be achieved by running multiple assays sequentially or simultaneously. And lastly is exporting your, your self-interest for, for a downstream sequencing. Oops, sorry. So what you can see right here is you have the OEP or the optoelectrode positioning system exporting or directing the cells out of the pen. So what you're seeing right here is the movement of the little plasma cell being um, directed out of the out of the pen into the channel, where it's going to be flushed into a single or, or, or a single well in a 96 well plate. And the plate can be stored at minus 80 before sequencing. So after introducing you to um, the general workflow of how the system works for, um, for our single B-cell screening platform, you might have some idea of why um, is the single B-cell screening faster and even more robust with just one cell. So just to break it down for you and have, it, have a little comparison with the hybridoma system or what you would do for ELISA screening. So the media, the media volume per pen or the nano pen on the chip for the screening um, for single B cell is one nanoliter. And if you have a total cell, uh, total cell number as being one cell, the concentration for your, for your screening system is one cell per one nanoliter. But your effective concentration, um, and here what I did is just to convert the unit or the, the, the unit for my media volume to one mil, um, 
to get my effective concentration, which is equal to 10 to the 6 cells per mil. And if you compare that to hybridoma, where immediate volume is 100 microliter, and the total cell you need to examine, uh, or you need to wait for to grow up, is about 10 to the 10 to the 4 cells per per well. Then your concentration for that system is 10 to the 4 cells per 100 microliter, which equals to 10 to the 5 cells per mil. And you can see right here, there's actually a tenfold increase in the single B cell screening system compared to the hybridoma system, which means you have an increased robustness and also sensitivity, which is also time. It saves you time for getting an assay readout because first, first of all, you don't have to wait for the cells to grow up to a certain density to allow you to detect your results. Um, and this means that the single B cell screening can be detected or the assay can be, can be uh, you, you can generate the result within minutes while hybridoma or ELISA, you have to wait for days to get your results. To summarize our platform, um, it, the OEP or the optoelectrode positioning system is used for the precise uh, movement or direction of uh, of single single cell into into the nanopens or to achieve single cell um, segregation. And the whole system is uh, after you import the cell is completely automated um, from from importing screening to export, and this can reduce the chance to introduce human error with less um, human handling time. And then also in the entire process is recorded digitally for quality control with both image and video. And the efficiency, as we just showed you. Um, this, the screening for hybridoma typically takes about three months because there are multiple rounds of screening from the parental clone to the subclone, and you have to wait for the cells to grow up. But with single B cell, um, the ProSpeed platform, this whole process can be done within a day, or it's, it's essentially less than a day. The resolution, and here what we mean by that is to, is the, your ability to access the vast antibody repertoire at the single cell scale, which is about a hundredfold or at least a hundredfold increase from, from hybridoma because your fusion is efficiency is typically one out of a thousand um, B cells that can, that can actually form a hybridoma for you to screen. So at that step, you are losing a lot of the, the, a lot of the B cells due to the limitation of your fusion efficiency. And lastly, the versatility and flexibility. Um, this system can be used to, for in-depth characterization, including affinities, specificity, and functionality for your B cell before you even export it for or for se or sequencing or, or sequencing. Uh, so to give you an overview of the antibody screening process against COVID-19, um, if we're using the hybridoma or phage display library system or the platform, um, the initial screening um, will be will be used for the target discovery or lead generation, and follows that is the lead identification and optimization, which can take weeks to months, and that includes. Um, characterizing or validating the binding and blocking activity using ELISA or FACS, and um, characterizing the virus neutralization effect. And here what we developed is a, is a pseudovirus system uh, for, for COVID-19. And next you have to uh, you have to validate the, the virus neutralization effect with the real COVID-19 and follows that as the in vivo functionality or animal studies before you move on to the clinical study or to even worry about developability. So the process is very arduous and very, um, it's a very long process, but with ProSpeed single B cell screening, we're we're what we're trying to achieve is to combine the initial screening, the binding and blocking activity, and then also to to look for virus that or to look for antibody lead that has a neutralizing effect using the pseudovirus, uh, the COVID-19 pseudovirus system on chip or during the screening process, which can be done with less than a day before we move on to the identification or the optimization and validation with the, uh, with, with the real COVID-19 and then also the, uh, the animal studies. 
So um, for the single visa screening, we also have been doing some in-house um, antibody discovery. Uh, we have screened for a total of um, 613 binders, and for within within those 316, we were able to identify about 90, 93 uh, binders that have a ligand block in effect. And with both of the assays, it's still the screening process is still completed within one day. And with um, and here I'm, I have a little schematic to show you the 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 experimental design and how we just how we uh, design our, our screening. So essentially, what you have is we have the RVD or the the receptor binding domain of the S1 protein conjugated to um, to a to a, to a bead, and the bead is used to capture so the um, the secreted antibody. So if you have a secreted antibody that's specific to RBD pro, RBD protein or the RBD S1 protein, it will be um, captured by the RBD bead, and then you add a fluorescent um, secondary antibody for the detection of um, the the correct um, specificity. And for the ligand blocker assay, what we had is the target cell line that's over um, expressing the ACE2 receptor, which is responsible for the interaction with the, uh, the virus and then the viral entry. Uh, and again, if uh, and the, so, if we have a secreted antibody um, that's that has a blocking effect, uh, we're we're trying to what we're trying to see right here is to is is it is essentially a negative result for uh, for the RBD, which is fluorescent, fluorescently tagged on 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 the stable cell line. So by that I mean if you have a secreted antibody that can block the interaction between the RBD or the binding of the RBD and the, our target cell line, we would not see the fluorescent signal that's generated from the RBD protein. Um, and here again, you have the secondary antibody that's used for the detection of the secreted antibody. And what other assays that we're trying to develop is the pseudovirus, uh, the COVID-19 pseudovirus um, assay. The pseudovirus is, um, we, what we have right here is, um, is to is to replace the the envelope glycoprotein of lentiviral vector by um, the cov19 spike protein um, and here what i'm showing you is some activation data where uh, we have different doses of pseudovirus and you can see the uh, the luminescence signal from the uh, the infected cells with different doses of pseudovirus so to, to verify the pseudovirus infectivity of our target cell line. And we also have done a neutralization assay where we have a positive, uh, positive control or positive antibody that was uh, success that can be used to, to successfully block of the effect of the, uh, the infectivity of pseudovirus. So the design of our experimental approach again in the schematic is showing that instead of using a ligand or the RBD protein or the ligand uh, the, the RB or the ligand for the ACE2, which is the RBD or uh, of the S1 protein, we can replace that with the uh, the EG uh, GFP expressing COVID-19 pseudovirus. So the idea is that if you have an antibody that's secreted from your plasma cell or from your cell of interest to no, to block the effect or of to block the pseudovirus infectivity of the target cell line, then uh, then we we can identify um, a, a, a antibody with the neutralizing effect. So and this experiment can be done on chip as well. So aside from the different assays that can be used to, to develop um, antibodies against COVID-19, we can also accommodate different sample species origin. So what I just introduced you before is uh, a tip, our typical workflow from immunized animal, or we can use transgenic animal for um, to save downstream uh, development time for humanization or um, or other um, or other related issues, and what we do is to harvest the spleen, the bone marrow, or the lymph nodes, depending on the uh, the immunization method, 
and we enrich for plasma cell and those subset will be directly used for screening. But what we can also do is to collect blood sample from recovered patient and isolate their PBMC. And those PBMC can either be used to enrich for plasma cell um, that can be used directly for screening or we can enrich for memory B cell, which, um, which will um, culture for several days and uh, for, for B cell activation. And with those culture, we can verify the ELISA positive culture, and, which can be uh, pulled together for screening. So from uh, sample collection or blood sample collection from recovered patient, isolating PBMC to verify ELISA positive culture for successful B cell activation. This process takes about three to five days, um, but this is significantly shorter than the two to eight weeks immuniz immunization process that, that, that's, um, that's required for, for, our, um, for our workflow with um, immunized animals. And here to present you some of our newest results for human B cell activation and single cell screening. And what you can see is that uh, this is the B cell or B cell subset that we enriched for uh, from frozen PB, frozen human PBMC. And then at day one, we're screening or we're staining uh, for uh, the CD38 marker for, for plasma cell or for human plasma cell or plasma blast. And at day three, you can see there's a significant uh, differentiation or expansion of the, uh, the culture or the subsets that are, that are now CD38 positive. And day, at day five, you have even uh, a more, uh, uh, even, even greater increase of that population. And for this particular test that we did at day three, we collected the sample uh, and then the total cell that we um, that we uh, that we used for, for screening was about four times ten to the fifth, and the single B cell or the, that we um, sorry the total cell that we collected from the B cell activation culture is about four times ten to the fifth, and the number of cells that we used for screening for screening uh, is is about eighty five hundred, and among those we were able to identify over two thousand or twenty two hundred that are IgG positive. To summarize, the GeneScript ProBio offers um, diverse functional leads against COVID-19 generated from different platforms, including, including the human naive and the llama naive for SDAB generation. Uh, or the single domain antibody generation. And the ProSB single B cell screening can really accelerate uh, your antibody discovery because first of all, it enables rapid screening, which can be done in less than a day, and it allows functional assay during the initial screening phase to save time and effort and also money for your downstream um, develop, de develop, development process. And lastly, we can provide the option to screen human B cell from recovered patients as well. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you for, for being here today, and I'm going to take some questions now. So first of all, um, the first question is the number of cells that are screened per chip. Uh, for, for the screening is, is, is typically, we, we have different formats for the chip, and then the one that has the, the largest, largest capacity is um, the 14K, 14K chip, which has about um, 14,000 uh, nanopens. And with that, we can typically pen or screen for 10,000 cells per chip. Um, what is our sequencing success for single cell sequencing? Um, right now, we are looking at what well, the single cell sequencing is not is never 100 percent successful. And right now we're looking at anywhere from 60 to 80 percent success rate. Um, is there any difference between this between sequencing the human B cell and um, trans, trans, or the immunized animals? Um, the answer is yes and no. Of course, the this, this primers that are going to be different because it's different species. But in terms of the cDNA uh, synthesis, which is the most critical step for single cell sequencing, um, the success rate is, is 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 about the same. And then also the uh, we are doing 
some validation and uh, optimization re related to sequencing human B cell, but we believe that the sequencing success might even be a little bit higher than uh, than than transgenic or or especially especially transgenic animals or or a, a mouse um, because this the, the C region for for human um, human VHVL uh, sequences are even uh, even more conserved. Thank you, Dr. Sean Taylor and Dr. Manzu Kang, for your informative presentation. As a reminder, our speakers will follow up with any questions you have submitted via email following this webinar. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, GenScript, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interest in questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand through the end of this year, 2020. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.